Hi there and welcome to this virtual revision guide for Unit 6 GCSE Biology and this module is all about plants. So just to remind you about plant cells, you should know that the structure of plant and animal cells, so you should know that both plant and animal cells contain a nucleus and the job of the nucleus is to control what the cell does and it contains the DNA. You should know that both types of cells contain a cytoplasm and the job of the cytoplasm is that is where the chemical reactions um, take place within the cell and they contain enzymes. You should know that mitochondria, are, which you can actually see in these diagrams, are found in both plant and animal cells and they often look um, a bit like sort of this sort of structure in the case of like a sausage sort of structure okay and the mitochondria is where respiration takes place to release energy you should know that plant cells have a cell membrane so the animal cells so this is the cell membrane in an animal cell which most people get correct um, and it's the thin line here the thin black line on animal on plant cells and a plant cell membrane controls what enters and leaves the cell you should know that plant cells only contain a cellulose cell wall which is that structure there and the cell wall which again is in plant cells only it's made out of a structure called cellulose that is um, involved in making sure that the cell has um, a supportive structure around the outside and maintains its shape the vacuole which is um, in plant cells only is that area there and that is a fluid cell um, sac that supports the plant cell keeps it what we call turgid and um, chloroplasts are the green parts that do photosynthesis and they're only in plant cells that are found um, above the ground so they wouldn't be in root hair cells and then on this list here you've also got ribosomes and ribosomes are found in both animal and plant cells and that's where protein synthesis takes place and you can't see them on here but ribosomes are often represented as dots on um, animal and plant cells so you need to know that animal cells and plant cells um, are very similar but animal cells are not are irregular shape whereas plant cells are more regular and they have those three extra structures a chloroplast a vacuole and a cell wall both types of cells are what we call eukaryotic cells because they have uh, a nucleus so we need to know some specialized plant cells some cells that are differentiated and adapted to carry out a particular function and um, the first type of plant cell that you should be aware of is a root hair cell and a root hair cell's function is that it absorbs water and dissolves minerals from the soil so in terms of doing this its adaptations that it has is it has a large surface area it's got this very particular shape to increase surface area to increase the amount of molecules that can diffuse in uh, via osmosis or active transport in one go it is thin it is only one cell thick hence you have to call it a root hair cell because this whole structure is one cell and it has mitochondria because the might the minerals have to go from a low concentration in the soil to a higher concentration in the plant so to go from low to high you have to do active transport and that uses mitochondria Another type of plant cell which people often overlook in revision is the palisade cell which is found in the leaves of plants and this whole function of the cell is to carry out the majority of photosynthesis in the cell. So as you would expect the adaptations of this one is it has loads of chloroplasts but the other adaptation is that it is a large surface area so it can capture as much sunlight as possible. Then the two that often people sort of overlook as well the first being xylem and the second being phloem so the xylem cells as you can see here are used for the process of transpiration which we'll come on to later which is the movement of water and dissolved minerals in that water up the plant so transpiration or movement of water always occurs up the plant and it occurs through these xylem cells which are joined together to make xylem tissue cells um, and it's a, basically a tube for water to go up but the water to make it a tube and a hollow tube the cells have to actually be dead so the, the mature cells in the plant have actually died because they have no end walls they are also um, covered in 
lignin, which is a sort of waterproof layer, and it was also sort of, it's basically what we would call wood, and that will make the cells strong as well. The flow-em is the translocation, is the translocation, which is the movement of sugars and things that are made in photosynthesis, and that can be up or down the plant, so wherever they're needed. So, for example, a leaf halfway up the plant could make the sugar, but that could keep going up to the top of the plant to the flowers. Um, and these are adapted by having something called sieve plates in them. So at the end of each cell, there are little holes um, which allow, instead of in a cell wall, it's a sieve plate which allow materials to go through. And the phloem cells are kept alive by something called companion cells, which do all the um, cellular reactions for them. Phloem cells also need a lot of energy to load the sugars in and out, and therefore they have lots of mitochondria as another adaptation. So plant cells is an ideal place to start studying osmosis, but it is important to understand this can happen in animal cells as well. And osmosis is the movement of water, and that's your absolute critical thing. You never talk about osmosis unless it's water, and if it is water, don't mention diffusion. So the water is the net movement of water from a high area, a high water concentration to an area of low water concentration through a partially permeable membrane. And that is the definition. It's really important to learn because any question about osmosis you get, you need to put that within the answer and apply it to the example you're given. So why is this so important? Well, if you look at it from an exam question point of view, you get one mark for saying osmosis is the net movement, which means the overall movement of water molecules. You'd get one mark for saying from an area of high or higher water concentration to an area of low or lower water concentration and one mark through a partially permeable membrane. So what does a high or a higher water concentration mean? Well, what that means is basically this side here, where you can see all there is on this um, side of the membrane is water molecules, whereas a low water concentration is over here. There are less water molecules, but more importantly, there is something dissolved in the water. So the highest water concentration you can have is pure water, um, and then anything dissolved in it lowers that water concentration. So you might have been asked to do a practical, you should have done a practical, required practical about osmosis at some point. And this is where we uh, add little bits of potato um, into different concentrations of sugar solution. So you would use a potato, you chopped it up into the same length and same diameter um, discs using a cork borer. That is a um, fair... Um, a fair testing, it's a control to make sure that you uh, have the same size uh, measurements. You would then um, make sure you measure them and you use a ruler to do that measurement and make sure they're all the exact same length. You would then add the same volume of solution into test tubes, which you can see here, and that volume would be another control variable, but the independent variable the thing you're changing is the percentage of sugar solution, so what's the concentration? You would then add your port, uh, your potato cores into each tube, leave them for a set amount of time after, and you'd measure them and weigh them beforehand and after it's reversed balance to measure the mass and see whether does the mass go up because the water moved into the potato or does the mass go down because the water moved out of the potato. And what you get is a graph like this. And uh, basically at some concentrations, the water um, would move into the potato. So if you had your potato there, and you were in a beaker of solution where the water had a higher water potential than the uh, potato, the water would rush in and the mass would go up because the water moves from a higher to a lower concentration of water via osmosis through a partially permeable membrane. But if the, potato, the solution had lots of sugar dissolved in it, it might actually have a lower water potential than the potato, in which case the water in the potato naturally would move out via osmosis, making the mass go down. And if you look at the exact point that it crosses zero, where there's no change in mass, that is where the concentration of the, um, the water potential or the concentration of water is exactly the same inside and outside the potato, so there's no movement in or out overall. And we call that solution isotonic. Let's have a little closer look at solutions and see what happens with them. So we've got here some different terminology. So isotonic, and this really is for higher tier, isotonic is when the concentration 
of let's say sugars let's say inside the cell in this case is the same as a solution outside the cell so some water moves in some water moves out and you see this in both animal and plant cells but there would be no um no change in the um in the cell so basically there's no mass increase or um mass decrease in the cell because there's the same concentration so water doesn't move one way or the other overall next term is hypertonic so this would be um when you have a higher solute concentration outside the cell and inside the cell so let's say there was loads and loads of uh, sugar in a beaker a really high sugary solution let's say 70% uh, sugar which is really high concentration of sugar in a solution the water would move out of the cell and it would move and the cell mass would go down and this can happen in animal cells so animal cells would lose mass and they would crumple up and it can happen in plant cells plant cells outer side would stay in the same shape though because the cell wall is strong but the in bit would come out and then you can have a hypotonic solution which imagine if you put your blood cell in pure water that would be a good example water would rush in and eventually the cell will burst the same could happen with a plant cell except for a plant cell the cell becomes turgid which means it can hold no more water but the cell wall maintains its shape and stops it bursting so you need to know about the structure of a leaf and what a leaf is and how what its job is and how it's adapted now a leaf is an example of a plant organ so if you remember an organ is a group of cells um or sorry a group of tissues that carry out a similar function or work together with the same function so lots of cells make a tissue lots of tissues make an organ so in a plant an organ could be the leaf the flower the roots okay and they all have different jobs now we you need to know the layers of a um of a leaf and what the different parts do so at the top of the so we start with the top layer of the leaf and the top layer is a waxy layer or sometimes called the waxy cuticle and it's a waterproof layer to stop water being lost from evaporation from the leaf we then have the upper epidermis which you don't actually need to know um, but that's there we then have the palisade layer, the palisade cells, sometimes the palisade mesophyll layers. As we said earlier on, these cells are adapted to doing photosynthesis. We then have the spongy layer, which also would contain potentially the xylem of phloem, which might be added in there, which we talked about earlier. And the spongy layer is full of air spaces. So gases can diffuse in and out of the cells to do photosynthesis. So overall, obviously it would be all air particles, but plants will want carbon dioxide to go in because they want that to do photosynthesis and they produce oxygen. So that would be able to diffuse out into the atmosphere. And at the bottom, we've got the stoma which is the heart the whole of the somata surrounded by guard cells which can open and close um, depending on whether it's night or day or if they need to preserve water and you also need to be aware which is um i probably have taught this a lot earlier on in the course but um there is a type of cell in plants and there's tips of the shoots and the roots called meri stem cells and they are like the stem cells of plant cells they're the only cells that can just divide um, and grow um, through cell division and mitosis so then there's a process called transpiration so transpiration is the movement of water up the plant and it goes from the soil into the roots through the xylem up the xylem and then water is evaporated from the stomata so when the sun shines onto the leaves it heats the water up turns it into water vapor and that causes the water to evaporate out of the leaf and that is um, then the water then comes up the plant to replace the water that's been lost um, and that brings new water and new minerals up and this is a natural thing that plants want to do but obviously in hot days it can have too much and plants can wilt if they lose too much water now factors can affect transpiration are high temperature the hotter it is the more water will evaporate and therefore the more transpiration moisture in the air if there's lots of water in the air there's no gradient there's no high to low so therefore there'll be less water if it's high to high less water evaporates wind the wind blows the water away light because if it's night time smarter tend to close so less water is lost and the surface area of the plants so cactuses for example have very small leaves they have spines instead of leaves and therefore they've reduced the surface area to reduce their transpiration rates 
So you need to understand about the reaction photosynthesis. You need to be able to remember and recall this word and symbol equation for your GCSE exam. So you should know and always think about it logically. Hopefully you know now by just having it into your head so many times we need plants to absorb carbon dioxide and they also absorb water from the soil. So carbon dioxide plus water is absorbed. That makes glucose, which is a sugar which we need, plus oxygen. And you should know that glucose has a formula of C6H12O6 and to balance all the others you use 6, 6 and 6. Now this reaction is an endothermic reaction and you need to know that style of reaction is because the light energy from the sun is absorbed into from the surroundings to power this reaction. And you often get questions asking about your growing um, plants and how they can increase it linking to the limiting factors of respiration. So what can limit it? So often people think water is a limiting factor, but it isn't because a plant would die a lot sooner than if it just um, ran out of water because of photosynthesis, so other things would kill it. So water isn't the limiting factor. So one that is, is light intensity. So if you increase the amount of light, you'd increase that rate of reaction. And at point um, A on the graph here, light intensity is the limiting factor. But when it levels off, you're still increasing the light, but at that point it doesn't go up anymore. So at point B, something else must be the limiting factor. And that could either be one of the other two things. So at point B on the first graph, um, the other limiting factor could be carbon dioxide concentration or temperature. On the second graph, you can see as carbon dioxide levels increase, so does the rate of photosynthesis. But about that point there again, and I'll say point B again, then at that point on graph two, carbon dioxide is no longer the limiting factor and it must be either um, light intensity or temperature. And on graph three, which links to enzymes, to go back to your enzymes uh, module, um, if you can't remember this, this shows you about temperature. Rate of photosynthesis is affected because it's an enzyme controlled reaction. As you increase the temperature, substrates and enzymes get more energy. They collide more often, make more enzyme substrate complexes. You get to the optimum temperature at the top as most collisions, and then the enzymes denature as the temperature increases. OK, so what you need to know is on these two graphs at point B and point A, what is happening? So at point A on this graph, it is light intensity that's the limiting factor. At point A on this graph, which I wrote, there we go, it is carbon dioxide that is the limiting factor. But at point B, it's no longer light intensity. It's either that one or that one. And you could say either in exam. Or for the carbon dioxide graph, the limiting factor is either that one or that one. Now, you will have done a required practical, which you need to look in much more detail than I can here now with you, uh, where you would have measured the rate of light intensity, if the photosynthesis may be using light intensity. All other factors must be kept constant, so you'd use um, control variables of temperature, you'd use control variables of maybe the amount of pondweed. The control variable won't be the amount of water the plant is in, because as long as it's fully submerged, you can't, doesn't matter how much there is. So what you do is position your bench lamp 100 centimetres away from the plant, add a set amount of water, add a set amount of so-called sodium hydrogen carbonate to create carbon dioxide in the water, Place freshly cut a bit of pondweed into the water. Allow two minutes for it to acclimatise and adapt to the conditions. Count the number of bubbles released in one minute period and then repeat for a second one minute period so you get a mean. And then repeat it, moving it close to the plant. And you need five different measurements. So 180, 60, 40 and 20 would be appropriate. Now you need to be able to recall that method in order to talk about it in the exam and also analyse the results. It's a very popular question.